All right. It's rolling. How you doing, Mark? How are you, Travis? Doing good. Thank you for being here. First of all, appreciate you, you know, you taking the time to come on. I'm sure you're busy. There's a bit to do you're with welcome. Griffith. You're most welcome. It's uh it's good to be able to talk about the place since there are no people here to talk to. Um since yeah. we're closed. So uh it's nice to to talk to somebody about the observatory. Yeah, such a bummer, I, you know, because I've been researching this. I watched your talk. I'm excited to talk to you. And then now I, I can't even come visit. I have to wait till you guys open again. Yeah, we all have to wait. It, yeah. uh, when we did the renovation, to be honest, the hardest thing was that the place was closed for four years and even we couldn't come here. And so it was very odd and uh, it's unpleasant and unnatural for a place like this, which is a very public place, to be closed. Mm -hmm. um it's obviously essential it's the only safe way of doing anything at the moment but yep. it it is it's it's not right <laughs> it's right. not it's not good it's it's not what you would hope for so you know we do what we do today to get to better times tomorrow yeah it'll happen it'll it'll all come back so yep, we, it we will. just gotta be patient um, yep. but that's part of why Griffith this Griffith Observatory is so special too is because it's pub, it's open to the public. That is exactly correct. Um, I think there are three things about it that are, are distinctive when I'm describing it to people and, uh, and unexpected, I think for many people, one of them is that it is a public observatory. So we are not nor were we ever, nor were we planned as any kind of research facility. We're a public facility intended to give people the opportunity to, as the director says, put eyeball to eyepiece and make observing um, something part of their life. The second thing is that we are literally a public observatory in the sense that we are owned by the city of Los Angeles, and many right. people are unaware of that. Yeah. And we're owned and operated by the Department of Recreation and Parks in the city. And so we are um, paid for by, I'm a city employee, all of our employees are city employees, and tax dollars that people pay in Los Angeles go to support the observatory. And part of that support enables the third surprising thing, which is we're free. And, uh, you know, institutions, a lot of institutions in the cultural space can't afford to be free or mm -hmm. just aren't free or, um, you know, it, it's uh, they have to charge something to be able to operate. Uh, and we do not. And yeah. so the thing that's nice about that is uh, when you walk outside and you look on the lawn and you're walking in the halls, what you see is Los Angeles the most diverse city in the United States. And our visitors look like Los Angeles because they are Los Angeles. They're also tourists from all over the United States and all over the world. Sure. But fundamentally, we are a resource for our city, uh, the city of Los Angeles, and all of the cities, the other 87 cities that are in Los Angeles County, which is 10 million people, which is the size of my home state of Ohio. So you, you start to get a sense of, wow, this is, a, this is a large place, and they have got this free resource in the middle of the largest park in, in the entire Western United States. And so it's kind of a, it's, those are all sort of surprising things that people find when they first come to the observatory. And people more and more are coming here as a destination because we've been in a lot of things, especially some notable things recently, most recently, La La Land, obviously. Oh, um, right. But, yeah. but Rebel Without a Cause and Terminator. Uh, the, director is very, the director is very fond of saying that, uh, that the observatory deserves a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And uh, yeah, I think, I think so. he is absolutely right, uh, because that, that building that we are sometimes identified as an observatory, sometimes identified as the Temple of Ming the Merciless or the Institute of Science or whatever it is that somebody has decided that we're going to fictionally play, uh, people have seen the building. Whether they knew what they were looking at or not is an right. entirely different thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Definitely. I don't think anyone would argue that Griffith Observatory is a, a L.A. icon landmark now. For sure. Agreed. Agreed. And, and it's been 
it's pretty much been that way since the beginning. Um, they started filming here before the building actually even opened in 1935, the very really? first movie, and then pretty much continuously since then. Um, and it runs the gamut from student films to commercials to TV shows to feature length movies to short movies. Sometimes we're in the background, sometimes we're in the foreground. Uh, it's everything you can imagine and then more. There's a lot of popular films that have been filmed here. Yes, Man and The Rocketeer, um, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, where a car blew up um, in front of the building, which thankfully was happening right before the renovation started. So uh, <laughs> there were no people around, which was pretty great. Right. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's become that iconic. It, the other thing that's actually interesting about sort of creating an architectural icon is it is a large white building on the side of a hill in view of a good four or five million people who live in the Los Angeles basin. Right. So, you know, we often get inquiries from marketing and advertising folks asking whether or not we would like to engage their services. And we just sort of politely say, well, we're part of a city, so that's not what we do. And right. moreover, the fact is we don't need to do it because we're cover. a big white building on the side of a hill in view of five million people. Um, right. Since since we reopened in 2006, we've gotten, you know, social media and the social media travel sites like TripAdvisor or Yelp have have made the building more of an attraction mm -hmm. in the sense of being on their lists of places to go. So, you know, now when people are going to another city, they're looking at lists online of where should I go when I'm in Los Angeles or anywhere else? And we tend to be clustered toward the top of that list, which is nice because that means people liked the experience they had here. Um, so it's made it's made us even more popular. We get uh, 1.6 million people through the doors Ooh. and then probably another. It's hard to say because we don't measure outside, but there's probably another equal to that number of people who come up to the hilltop and just stand on the terraces and look out at Los Angeles and get the view that you see behind me. Yeah. Um, or they hike up to the Hollywood sign or they hike up Mount Hollywood or they just hang out, you know, in the park because, mm -hmm. you know, we're surrounded by Griffith Park. So it's a it's definitely a place that whose visibility has risen substantively as social media and online resources have given a better way of sharing both what it is and where it is. Yeah. Well, no, that's great to hear. And I mean, it's deservedly so you guys have that. I mean, and you go there and you get the, you get to visit, you know, the site where Arnold Schwarzenegger walked in the Terminator and you get a great view of Hollywood's the Hollywood sign. And then you dive down and then you guys have a great museum that's free and you can look at all the cells. There's just so much. It's awesome that this has all come together kind of over the years to be this, you know, incredible place to visit. You're showing remarkable restraint by not actually mentioning that when former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger walked across our lawn in the Terminator, he was also wearing nothing. That's right. And uh, <laughs> that that people forget the sort of that iconic opening of that movie and just exactly. And of course, he was just an actor at the time, though, well known. Uh, he certainly wasn't California's governor then because it's generally not probably something that California governors do, which is gamble around California landmarks wearing <laughs> nothing. But, you know, he did it in service to art, so good for him. Um, yeah. And it, it is one of those notable moments that people mention about the building. You had referenced the fact that, uh, that there's, there's a lot of stuff inside, and, and all of the things that are inside, you know, in their general character, are were specified by uh, um, Griffith Griffith in his will. Um, yes. So we're uh, where we have the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, which is a planetarium theater. Um, we have telescopes that people obviously, because we're an observatory, um, people can use public telescopes to observe the sun or observe the night sky. Uh, we have exhibits, which which Griffith specified. 
And then finally, the last specification was actually our location, uh, which, as you see in the image, is on an outcropping of Mount Hollywood that overlooks the basin because uh, Griffith wanted people to sort of lift their vision and 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 be an observer, even if they weren't necessarily looking at the sky. He actually wanted the observatory to be on Mount Hollywood, which is behind, well, it's behind the picture in the other direction, behind uh -huh. me. And uh, when the architects came on in 1931, they quickly uh, came to the conclusion that that was a bad idea, um, both because it is a remote location and because there's even less space for parking, um, mm. even harder to get roads, and so on and so forth. So they compromised on this sort of hill, the, the, the outcropping on the downslope of Mount Hollywood. But we are on Mount Hollywood. Um, the Hollywood sign, interestingly enough, is uh, on Mount Lee, which oh. is to the west of here, about a mile and a half if, as the crow flies. So people get confused about that, thinking that Mount Hollywood is where the Hollywood sign is. But that's actually a different mountain. We are on Mount Hollywood. So, Oh, OK. I didn't even know. Those were all things that he specified all the major components of the building. And so when people come... You know, all of those components are free, the, the night, daily and nightly public observing, the exhibits, admission to the building, um, except for the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, where we charge a modest fee to see the show. Um, Griffith had actually specified a science theater, a science theater. But when Planetarium, but he died in 1919, Planetarium technology was developed in 1924. And, oh, okay. and uh, so the centennial of that is coming up in uh, in Germany. And so his family, when they were working on uh, adjudicating the will, uh, agreed with the suggestion that had been made by the trustees that, in fact, they substitute a planetarium for the science theater. Uh, oh. Because it would have been something that he would have wanted, because you can essentially use the planetarium uh, star projector to recreate stars in to recreate the night sky inside mm -hmm. of the Samuel Ocean Planetarium. And, and that would have been an observational activity. And so that would have been right in line with what Griffith wanted people to do right. uh, when they came here. So it was, it was very much aligned with everything. We were the third planetarium in the United States. Uh, Adler in Chicago was the first. We were the first on the western, uh, in the western part of the United States, actually on the entire Pacific Rim. Uh, so we wow. were we were early on um, in that in the use of that technology, and we are the only major planetarium that has, throughout its entire history, only given live shows. Uh, since we're Hollywood's planetarium, I think they decided early on that it was the most effective way of presenting and the most effective way of engaging people in a story. And that's what we tell in our planetarium. We're not interested in giving people tours of the sky or latest developments. Uh, we want to tell a story that uses the sky um, because there's a lot of stories that are there. And stories obviously have always been told by people to people. And we like that approach. And it fits with Hollywood, which is where stories are told by people to people. Um, maybe not live, but in our case, we like to do it live and we think it's more effective. And the audience seems to agree. Uh, so we're, we're one of the continuing pioneers, I guess you could call us, in regard to live pro the value of live programming. More and more are, are readopting it, at least for some programs. Um, in our case, we do every single program live. So wow. you always hear uh, a different voice. Um, and surprisingly, although it may not be to you since you're somebody who's, who's used to talking um, into a microphone, the tone, tenor, and character of a voice can make the same exact production and same exact words sound very different. Sure. Uh, and so there is a variety among our uh, I think now it's uh, 12 or 13 um, observatory lecturers that do our shows in the Samuel Ocean Planetarium. 
that, you know, each one of them brings something different and distinctive to it. Uh, and I think audiences appreciate that. That's great. I got to come because I'll be honest, I've never been to a planetarium or seen the show because when I was younger, up maybe like, you know, eight or 10 years old, we were me and my family were traveling up in San Francisco and I there's there's one up there that we were going to go see and we were all excited to go and it was all hyped up and it was a big deal. And we get there and like the tickets are all sold out. So I think to just make me feel better, my dad goes, that's eh, just a, it's basically just a movie on the ceiling anyway. It's no big deal. <laughs> and so I, that's just like, you know, that's stuck with me. So I've never, I've never seen one. I've never even really looked into them. But now after learning about what it kind of is and have, you guys have a live person there, I got to come check it out. I think you do. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. It's uh, it, it's quite a, a spectacular kind of experience. Uh, and I think you'll like ours um, in part because we, we don't use the dome as a screen. We use it as a way of putting you into an environment. And so we have video projectors, but we also have a Zeiss star projector. And so the Zeiss Star Projector is the most sophisticated instrument in the world at creating the night sky. And it's even more sophisticated than the one that's in New York because we bought the same model as New York, but we asked Zeiss to make some improvements so that even fainter stars would be a little bit more visible um, mm -hmm. so that it would look more as it would to your eye if your eye was in Joshua Tree. Oh, not okay. you know, there's nothing impressive about looking at the night sky if you're in Los Angeles, because <laughs> right. while the sky is the same, uh, its appearance is not the same because it's washed out by all the light. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were out in Joshua Tree and you had a good set of eyes, um, you would be able to perceive a, an almost unimaginable amount of stars um, in the sky. And uh, that's what we wanted to create was something that was as authentic as it would be if you were standing underneath them. And that's the way we present them. So our dome, a lot of domes that you might go into are, you know, sort of tilted the way uh, sort of tilted like that. And then the audience sits like that, right, sort of the yeah. way you would in an IMAX theater. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a perfectly logical reason for people in terms of presentation for doing that, including, you know, rate seating and so on and so forth. But the thing that you lose then is you lose the idea of a natural horizon, you know, because this is not a natural horizon. This is a natural horizon. Sure. And you see behind me, you know, that's the horizon where mm -hmm. the sky and the earth come into into meeting with each other. And, and so our dome is like that. So it's flat, you yeah. know, over it, it, it arcs over a horizontal horizon. And as a consequence, when we put the stars up, it seems like you just happen to be sitting under the stars and you could be sitting outside in a lounge chair in Joshua tree. And it's perfectly comfortable, you know, 70 degrees, which is rare in Joshua Tree unless it's winter. Yeah. Um, like right now, I think it's 115 degrees today yeah, in Joshua Tree. Right. So it so you would not want to do. You'd much rather be in our planetarium on a day like this. Yep. And uh, and you have that experience. And then when we have video components, we use them in a way that you're in space or you're. So it's not just a movie, and and we don't. We have no interest in showing people movies on a dome. That's not our purpose. There's right. lots of wonderful theaters, even the Cinerama Dome, which actually does sometimes show people movies on a, the on a dome. But uh, that's not our purpose. And, sure. you know, in a way that goes to the homogenization of, of the world, which is, and it's nice that... Uh, science centers in, in some respect and planetariums in some respect haven't bought into that. So mm -hmm. if you go to Chicago or you go to New York or you go to Oakland or Denver or here, you'll have a different experience in the planetarium um, at each one of those places. They have different programming philosophies. They have different storytelling philosophies. They have different equipment. Their domes are oriented in a different fashion. So you'll 
you won't have the exact same experience anywhere you know else that you go and in our community there's no reason for us to be in competition with any of those places because why it, right. it, it gains us nothing it gains them nothing you can't go to oakland to spite us um you have to be in oakland and go to the planetarium at chabot yeah and same thing if you're you know so it's it's everything is not exactly the same and and the rest of the building is like that as well if you're here when we did the exhibits we tried to make them be like you're learning about observation and about astronomy but in a way you're in Los Angeles. And so there are reminders throughout the building and the interior, and then obviously on the exterior, that you're in Los Angeles, that you're not in any place, you're in a place, and it's right there, and that the city is right behind you, and, and that's the character of this place, so that, so, that, that, so that it's not generic, it's not the same, because, because we are up on a hill. And parking is difficult and access can be difficult when roads are full and times are busy. Not like now, um, but as you said, one day we will come back to those times. And when we do, you know, it is a bit of a pilgrimage uh, to get up to us. There are now also buses and other way and people are walking because we built a new sidewalk. So there's lots of ways to get here, but you have to actually make your way. And so if you're going to make your way to some place, then you ought to be able to have an experience that is a little bit better than what you could get just by looking at the experience online. Yeah. And so we, we are very much about the in-person, on-the-hill experience of our visitors, and we get a lot of them, and uh, they get to have that experience. And they have it at their own pace and to their own extent. So there are people who enter the building probably if i were being honest just to go to the bathroom or to get some air conditioning uh and then there's people who spend five hours reading every caption of every exhibit um, right. which i'm grateful for because i helped write them uh but uh and i think that they're i think they're lovely um our lead writer was a, a woman named carolyn collins peterson who is very active in the planetarium community uh and she wrote every word uh that's in this building Wow. Uh, that's in an exhibit over 25,000 and they have a they have a nice quality to them they, it, it's not like a it's not like a dictionary it's it's more like the exhibit panel is talking to you which mm -hmm. is, is a, which we we don't have a lot of sound in the building uh because you know you if you know the building inside there's a lot of marble there's a lot of travertine uh there's a lot of hard floors and so the building is very echoey and right. with people inside, it's very loud. So we didn't add a lot of sound into it, uh, but the words have a certain lyricism to them. And so, you know, there are people who read every single one of them and look at every single picture and try to understand every single exhibit. Yeah. Um, we tried to make the exhibits be very visual because we're an observatory. So, you know, they aren't as um, touchable as you would as you would think of as a, at a science center and part of that is LA has the California Science Center right. and it has the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County so we don't need to do what they do that yeah. when people want that experience they'll go there and it's great they come to Los Angeles they get to go to these three amazing museums um that all do a different kind of thing all sort of approaching science from a different kind of angle and our angle is the more visual, you know, how does the sky work? How do objects in the sky interact with each other? What does that mean? How does it affect you? Um, how do you perceive it? Uh, and that is what our exhibits are trying to do. But because we're trying also to reward people for making the pilgrimage, um, the exhibits are uh, large or they're elevated or they're colorful, um, yeah. not to no purpose but to an actual purpose of there's a reason why there's a color there. Um, and the design is such that it will capture your eye and get you to do this and look up. Yeah. And, you know, the truth is uh, everyone in the museum community is very interested these days in learning objectives. 
and you know federal grants are very are rife with that term and with evaluation and so on and so forth, which is all to good purpose in its own way. Um, we our learning objective is we we can't have a singular learning objective because as I said, people come into the building for wildly varying periods of time, yeah. and they do so for wildly varying reasons, and so. You know, in some senses, and and the purpose of the building actually is not to educate. Education occurs here, and Mm -hmm. we're grateful that people are interested in knowing more. But really, what Griffith wanted, um, what we want, is to inspire people. Um, Mm -hmm. These days, the inspiration takes a slightly different form, which is, you know, to get people off their phone or to get them to separate from the reality of the moment, and instead contemplate what's in front of them or what's above them or what's around them. And to think about that and what it means and to be inspired to look at something or to know something or to research something or to find something. And we are lucky in the sense that we can do that in a very... um, impactful way without having to be providing every single detail Mm -hmm. because we live in a time where if you want to the moment you see something that you get inspired by you can return to your phone and you can find just a library full of information about it right Um, whether it's jupiter or it's a star or a nebula or a supernova or a black hole or galileo or any of a number of other things that you might encounter here. And that wasn't the case with museums when we were established in 1935. Mm -hmm. In many respects, the interaction that people had with science was very much about, I went to the museum, and I saw this, and I read this, and I learned this, and maybe you could then go to a library and find a book. Maybe. yeah. Um, And so it wasn't... It, you know, so you had to be a little bit more uh, didactic about how you presented information because that might be the only way that people could get information. Uh, yeah. And so museums tended to be more uh, stuffed with things and stuffed with facts uh, because that's what they kind of had to do for some of their audience. Today, museums don't need to be like that because the internet and, and, The sharing of the information society makes it possible to, if you find something you're interested in, you can chase it down a rabbit hole for, you know, minutes, hours, weeks, days, months, years, and learn. If you wanted, for example, we have a Tesla coil. If you don't know anything about Nikola Tesla, um, if you Google Nikola Tesla, You could read literally for years about the thing, about him and what people think of the things that he thought and the things that he did and the things that he invented and what that meant and his battle with Edison and, 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 and. I mean, when I first did it, I was stunned because I knew very little about him and realized there is, there is... uh, there is so much here and people are so interested that they've created all of this content. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, uh, so we're, we're lucky in some respects when we did the exhibits that we didn't have to be universal and we didn't have to be all inclusive and we didn't have to be encyclopedic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we only have 20,000 square feet of actual exhibition space inside the building. And so you, you sort of had to choose a theme. And then stick to it. And our theme was the visitor as observer, um, because we're an observatory. And then the building as the instrument. So whether you learn more about how light works in a telescope, or you actually look through a telescope, or you actually figure out how seasons are happening on the Earth and why that is based on a model that shows why it is or you're in the Samuel Ocean Planetarium and you're learning about the connection between 
the Big Bang and the way the universe looks today. You know, all of those are things that you can experience um, as an observer. Mm -hmm. And and we try throughout the building and outside to give people observing experiences that they can resonate with. Um, If they walk out the door and their inclination, you know, after they leave the observatory is to look up at the sky, um, hopefully more than once, then we've done something um, aside from just, you know, sort of entertain them for some period of time. And that's the kind of impact, you know, get them to think, get them to look. Mm -hmm. Um, Observing is about looking, you know, whether it's out over a city, up at the sky, looking safely at the sun when, you know, through the proper shielding and and filtering. So never look at the sun without that. Um, I'm obligated to say that because... Because yeah. you, you normally the normally the message is don't look at the sun, and we sort of violate that message by saying, well, you can look at the sun, but you have to do this, this, and this. But yeah. you really just have to keep reinforcing the idea you really can't look at the sun without a lot of special equipment and gear. Right. So, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons why Griffith specified that the building have a solar telescope. Yeah. So that people could look at the sun safely. Um, he'd encountered the solar telescope at Mount Wilson, which is a research obser- a, 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 a seminal research facility, uh, research observatory about 40 miles to the east of here, up in the San Gabriel Mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, and he went there, and he had experiences there that led him to the belief that there needed to be public observatories or a, at least a public observatory right. um, because he'd had his experience up there because he was a wealthy man and he was a notable man. And he had access that other people couldn't have. Um, also at the time that he went up there, you could only get up there by riding a burrow and, uh, or a donkey. And that's not really practical for large numbers of people. Also, uh, Mount Wilson was a research institution, so the idea of you know the public streaming up there to engage with the research astronomers was not practical right. uh, from the standpoint of doing research, and also in terms of the nature of their facilities. So that's why he wanted it to sort of be brought down to the people, um, which was very much sort of the democratic idea that he had when he gave the park to the city. Um, yeah. which was that there should be a place for people to go. Yeah, because, yeah, let's, can we dive into that a little bit, that history? Because, yes. yeah, well, first of all, his name is Griffith J. Griffith. Like, is there any story behind that? Uh, it, it's the name so nice they named him twice. I guess Other so. than that, I have no idea. <laughs> all right, I love, that's hilarious. I'm glad his parents did that. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, can you just tell me a bit about him and his wealth and, you know, the story about his wife and that kind of stuff? Because that's, I find that fascinating. It is, he is an interesting person, and, and in some respects, he fits perfectly into the moment that we live in, which is a moment where we are learning, which actually that shouldn't be the way that it is because the people, you know, notable people who've done things in history are people first and foremost. They're not, they're not uh, exclusively good or exclusively bad. And they've got histories and they're, and in some cases they're very complicated. Um, My favorite president is Thomas Jefferson. He is a person who made gigantic contributions to uh, the formation and success of the America and the United States that we know today. He is also a man who kept slaves um, throughout his life up to the time that he died and uh, didn't free them all when he died. So, so, you know, he's a complicated person and uh, there are positive and negative qualities to him as a person. And I think instead of some of the education that we get, which is, you know, these people are heroes and they live in this very narrow slot in the world yeah. um, and you're supposed to, you know, worship them. Um, 
you know, I think people are people and they do some, some things and some of them are very bad. And it doesn't mean that their accomplishments are, are tainted by that, but they are conditioned by it. And, yeah. and worshipfulness has to be conditioned by that as well. And all of that is sort of to your point of Griffith. So Griffith was a man who grew up in Wales, uh, was fairly poor uh, based on the limited records that they have, emigrated to the United States when he was a teenager and made his way to the West Coast and found himself working uh, as a journalist um, for newspapers and magazines Mm -hmm. and decided to make one of his uh, one of his areas of expertise, uh, mining, particularly silver mining, uh, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the rules about, uh, ethics and all sorts of things like that, that we know today, also the complexity and interactivity of inter- information today is very, very different than 150 years ago, which is when he was doing that. Right. And so, you know, in some respects, journalists learned a lot about the subjects they were covering. And as a consequence, you know, if you manage to, as he did, uh, generate some extra money, you could invest in the thing you were covering. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what he did. And uh, he hit it big. So. So, so he made a lot of money, uh, and, and then he used that money and he got into real estate and he made more money and he ended up owning, uh, the Rancho Las Feliz or Las Feliz, um, which is this one of the, and it's a section of it, one of the old ranchos that made up a big part of the infrastructure of what we now know as Southern California, Mm -hmm. um, the big Mexican ranches, uh, that, that, uh, you know, huge tracts of lands, thousands of acres, uh, in size, or in some cases, tens of thousands of acres in size. He ended up owning that. And he, he was an interesting man in the sense that he, uh, really loved Los Angeles and thought that it was going to be a great city mm-hmm. in the world. And he had traveled to Europe with his mother and he'd gone to the great cities of Europe, like London and Paris and Rome. And when he came back, he sort of got this notion in his mind that Los Angeles was going to be a great city in the future. Um, he had a vision about how Los Angeles was going to grow. Sure. And he felt that when Los Angeles did grow, that one of the things it was going to need was going to be a great park. And so in late De- in December 1896, he announced that he would be giving a substantive amount of uh, Rancho Las Feliz to the city of Los Angeles uh, as a park um, for the common people, as he said. Uh, to go and that access to the park needed to be free um, in perpetuity. And the city, uh, it's an interesting thing about cities uh, because cities think about practical things when they're given gifts. Normally you think, oh, I'm getting a gift. That's fabulous. I would love to have that gift. Please give it to me now. Yeah, right. Um, But some gifts, and, and people, because most gifts are things that they hand to you and you take them and you unwrap them and, oh, yay, I have that. And wow, that's so exciting. I love it so much. Um, but cities, when they get certain kinds of gifts, have to think, now, how are we going to maintain that gift? And how are people going to get to the gift? Because at the time that he gave the gift, um, the very southern edge of the park was still two miles away from the very northern edge of the city limits of the city of Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so Griffith Park wasn't even in the city of Los Angeles when he gave the gift. And there were no roads, and there were no trails, and there was no access, and there was nothing. 
there was just this big empty space that was mostly chaparral. So a lot of the, you know, it wasn't nearly, it didn't have nearly as many trees as it does today. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, a lot of those were planted along the, some of them were planted along the way mm-hmm. because it's, it's chaparral, you know, so it's, it's not, it's designed to be in what Los Angeles is as a native sort of biome, which is a quasi desert kind of biome. Right. Um, and so, you know, your, your vegetation has to fall into line with that. So anyway, the city thought about, you know, how are we going to do this? And uh, do we really want something like that? Thankfully, um, in America, the desire to own land generally trumps everything. And in this case, the city, I think, came to the correct conclusion that at some point in time, the city limits will expand and they will encompass this part and people will want to go there and it is worth it to have more land. So thank you, sir. And we'll name it after you. I think that was required. Uh, so yeah, yeah. he did gave he, that. It, did Griffith require that it was named after him? I believe so, but I'm not certain. So okay. let me let me be let me be conditional about that. That's fair. Um, it was named Griffith Park uh, pretty much right away. So okay. I think the city felt that it it needed to do that. And at the time, he was you know obviously with this gift, it was one of the largest gifts that had ever been made. Probably the largest gift to date that had been made to the city of any uh, of the, of Los Angeles of any kind by anyone. Right. So, so he was very popular in his own way, um, and uh, even had the affectation of calling himself Colonel Griffith, even though he had never actually served as a colonel in any branch of the military, nor had he actually <laughs> served in any branch of the military as anything. So it's it's not clear right. why he felt that he wanted to be called Colonel Griffith, but he did, and and people abided that. Sure. Um, and uh, you know, for a number of years, uh, you know, the city was still trying to figure out, okay, how exactly do we use this? And it's for those people who are watching, who are, have been to Los Angeles, in particular to Hollywood and Hollywood and Highland. Uh, if you imagine taking Hollywood Boulevard east and west, and mm-hmm. you start at Hollywood and Highland, which is really built up and, you know, it's sort of the epicenter of Hollywood and then a little farther down to the east is Hollywood and Vine and there's big towers there and the Walk of Fame and lots of tourists and little stores. You know that is the way that it is today. If you go back and you look at a picture from 1904, there's two big houses at the corner of Hollywood and Highland. And then as you go to the east on Hollywood Boulevard, there isn't anything. As a matter of fact, there isn't even a lot of Hollywood Boulevard beyond that. Wow. And you get farther and farther to the east, and maybe there's a house here, and maybe there's a house there. But there's none of the sprawl and expanse of housing that you're used to seeing today was there then. There's a picture that we have in our exhibit upstairs where um, what we believe is Griffith is standing in the Baldwin Hills, which are about 20 miles south of here. There, a set of hills rises up sort of in the middle of Los Angeles um, to the south. And you can look back then on the Hollywood Hills. And it's a picture from 1900. And you're looking back at the Hollywood Hills. And fundamentally, there's almost nothing between you and the Hollywood Hills. Wow. So if you look behind me and you see the way the city is now, imagine a time when there was nothing in that view of anything there was just this big open dusty emptiness um with a house here and there and then ultimately you know it built up and it built up and it built up and uh the first restaurant in hollywood muso and frank was in 1919 or 1920 wow so things started to get You know, they started the movie industry started to coalesce in Hollywood and Mm -hmm. stuff started to get built up. But there was no sprawl and there was no congestion and there was nothing like that. So the early years were establishing sort of some connectivity to the park and the eastern part of the park is flat. And that's where 
amenities got built over time, whether it was the merry-go-round or the the zoo, the old yeah. zoo, and then the new zoo, and then picnicking areas and baseball fields and soccer fields and so on and so forth. Where the observatory is, is more in the central and western part of the park, which is much hillier, much more sort of back to nature, kind of the way that it always was, with the exception of some additional trees and uh, lots of trails and a lot more wildlife, you know, roaming around. Um, I'm sorry. that So I've sort of rambled along to get to the moment where, but, and, and so having given the park in 1896, Griffith was notable in the community and people thought well of him, but he, he drank um, uh, too often to excess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when he drank, he, he got into these violent rages yeah. and he had one one night and uh, shot his wife in the face. Oh. And, you know, there's uh, right. Yeah. So and there's nothing there's nothing to be said about that other than it's awful yeah. and unforgivable. Yeah. And even in its time was unforgivable, which is, you know, given uh, w- women were not treated equally in those times. Right. And uh, but the awfulness of what he had done was recognized at the time um and uh and mrs griffith thankfully survived yeah uh, and and managed to secure and this is probably apocryphal as opposed to an actual fact but it is said that she achieved the fastest approval of a divorce in california history (laughs) um a matter of in a time when women did not get treated well by courts in in arguments with their husbands. And, uh, but I guess in this case, what he did was regarded even in its time as being such an affront that uh, she was treated appropriately as a a terribly aggrieved victim uh, and was given the justice that she deserved. He was given two years in prison, um, (laughs) which... I think by any contemporary standard, one could only say is not justice of any sort, uh, short of some amazing legal argument about impairment, which, you know, they'll buy only so much today. And I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not going to get into it. But certainly if you shoot someone in the face, whether it's your wife or anyone else, two years in prison doesn't quite seem like it matches the severity of the crime. Yeah. Um, By all accounts, he was a model prisoner, which doesn't excuse anything. It just sort of goes to maybe how he got out sooner than he was supposed to. And and he wrote a a variety of publications while he was in prison. And one of them was a publication about how prisons could be improved. So, you know, there may have been a self-serving aspect to it. Who can say it's, you know, people's rehabilitation or redemption or anything else is well beyond my capability to analyze. Uh, when he got out, uh, he had, as I described earlier, is he was still a notable person in society and he was still wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but he was not particularly well liked, uh, right. but he was still wealthy and wealthiness, you know, buys access to things that normal people can't get at, access to, even if they don't like you. And in this case, it got him access to Mount Wilson. And so he was able to make his observation through, at the time, the largest telescope in the world, which is a 60-inch diameter telescope. And he looked through it at, uh, I think, a nebula and pulled his eye back. And someone who was there, uh, John Anson Ford, who now has a theater named after him in Hollywood, uh, said, if, if all mankind could look through that telescope, it would change the world. Wow. And, and that's where he got his idea that there was a transformative aspect to looking through a telescope, that mm-hmm. it could change your perspective on the world. And that's where he got his idea that there should be a public observatory, one yeah. where where the common person, as he would describe it later, 
could look through a telescope and have an experience not unlike his own um, and be inspired and be transported and elevated. Um, whatever it is one might think of him as a person, uh, he, he, did, he did have that sort of, there was no question in, in any historical record that he had that sort of vision about what was important about this and wanted it to be shared and mm-hmm. was willing to put up money and give the city money to do it and uh, to have it be free and to be something that was shared with people. Yeah. So yeah. the city was um, profoundly uninterested in taking his money because he was still a pariah. Yeah. And he proposed the observatory on a number of occasions and the city uh, had one, you know, basically said, no, thank you. Uh, move along. Yeah. Uh, but he, but he didn't, he didn't lose the desire. So when he died in 1919, um, he left it in his will and he specified that the money should be held in trust, um, to build the observatory and then the specifications that I mentioned earlier, or the key yeah. components. Um, also that the money in the trust be used to build um, a performance venue, uh, the Greek theater, which oh, is I just down the, it's just down the hill from us. Uh, we sort of are right on the hill above it. We can look down into the Greek theater. People drive by the Greek theater on their way up the winding road to the observatory. Mm-hmm. And his money paid for the construction of the theater, which opened in 1930. Uh, cool. And there have been iconic perform. It's an outdoor theater um, built into the hillside. And so is, and, and it's sort of a, for those of, for people who are familiar with Los Angeles, it's like a, a more comfy, cozy version of the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Um, a little bit steeper in its seating and a little, and obviously more compact because it only seats about 6,000 people, whereas mm-hmm. the Hollywood Bowl seats over 20,000. Um, Both of them iconic in their own way. There have been movies and famous concerts shot at the Greek, and it's famous too. The connection with Griffith is is rarely ever known or mentioned, uh, but his money did fund that. And then uh, three years later, they, they, they adjudicated the will that allowed the Greek to be built, that then allowed architects to come on, design the observatory, Austin and Ashley, famous architects in Los Angeles. Um, And then in 1933, they laid the cornerstone for the building. And then not soon thereafter, there was a terrible, terrible earthquake in Long Beach. And that earthquake uh, was profound in the sense of the damage that it caused and in the realization that earthquakes were a facet of Southern California that needed to be dealt with in the building codes. Yeah. And so they were, that earthquake was the sort of the spur to the development of, of building standards that seriously took earthquakes into account, in ter- in, in, especially in terms of masonry structures, which are particularly not resistant to earthquakes because they're connected together by mortar. And so they'll just shake apart and then bricks will fly everywhere or fall yeah, down or chimneys will collapse or any of those kinds of bad things that you don't really want to have happen. Cause when things are falling, people are generally under them and that's a bad thing. And that's relevant to the observatory because the original design for the building was that it was going to be covered in terracotta tiles. Oh. And that the terracotta tiles were also going to be over the main dome. And so, so after the earthquake, um, the architects couldn't wait for the new building standards to be promulgated. So they came up with what they thought would be the best thing to do. So they removed the tiles, and the tiles were going to be a couple inches thick. Mm-hmm. So what they did was they just took the entire superstructure of the building, mostly the, the surrounding walls, and they put more rebar in them and they increased the amount of concrete so that our exterior walls are in the range of a foot thick. Wow. They basically filled up the distance that was going to be filled by the, 
terracotta tiles with more concrete. And the building was a poured concrete structure, which was a, um, an interesting and new-ish construction technique at the time, and relatively speaking, uh, inexpensive in its own way, um, and considered to be very, very solid. And particularly if you make walls that are a foot thick, uh, the observatory even to this day is probably one of the better places that one might want to be if there was a major earthquake wow. in Los Angeles, because it's pretty, it's like a fortress, essentially. Yeah. And so they built the building in two years, uh, mostly with funds from the bequest. Uh, then there's also the Astronomer's Monument, which is on the front lawn. That was actually the only part that wasn't built primarily with the bequest. That was built with funds from the Public Works of Art project. And it's an obelisk that has six famous astronomers on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually designed by the, the man who later went on and designed the Oscar statuette. Oh, um, that's cool. So it was, yeah. So it's a, it, but it was paid for by the Public Works of Art project, which was a New Deal project, which means it was federal money. Um, designed to keep artists employed and engaged during the Depression. Right. Um, and then the, the Astronomer's Monument was finished in late 1934, and the building was finished in uh, spring 1935, and the opening ceremony took place on the lawn uh, on May 14th, 1935, which is when the observatory came into its public operation and was the day that it transferred from the trust, uh, Griffith's trust, mm -hmm. to the city of Los Angeles. Wow. And the city of Los Angeles is obligated by the terms of the acceptance to operate the building in perpetuity um, with free admission. Interesting. So that was something that Griffith put into the stipulation, was that the building be free. And, you know, as a museum professional, I can tell you that there are a lot of my colleagues at other institutions who would love to have their buildings be free. Yeah. So if people wonder sometimes, gosh, you know, why is it so expensive to go into this building? Well, most of the places you're going into that are other museums, they're not for-profit institutions. They're nonprofits or they're owned by, you know, in, in a few cases, they're owned by cities or counties or states. And they need that admission money to be able to operate. Yeah. Uh, we are lucky in two regards. One of them is there's this little whole prohibition against charging um, that's written into our DNA. Right. And second, we're owned by a city. And the city takes its responsibility through the Department of Recreation and Parks seriously. And we are operated by the department as a public good, um, right. just like you'd operate a park. You know, you don't charge people to get into parks. You don't charge people to go to a rec center um, to play basketball on the courts or to do well, to do a lot of things you can't do today, unfortunately. Um, so those are all probably really bad examples. But, <laughs> you know, the, those things are operating. I mean, parks and recreation, recreation and parks in Los Angeles's case are regarded as public goods. And they are investments that cities make to improve and enhance the life of people in the city. And uh, the observatory is regarded as one of those sort of uh, enhancements. It's a special kind of enhancement. It's a different sort of enhancement. Um, the only reason we're allowed to charge for the Samuel Ocean Planetarium is because of a codicil to the will um, that basically recognized that planetarium technology, um, the machines that were involved in operating the planetarium and just the whole technological infrastructure of a planetarium theater is the kind that costs more money than just a gallery of exhibits um, mm, okay. or even operating a public building. Yeah. It, it, there's a special quality to it, and you have to replace a star projector with a star projector, and you can't you can't sort of skimp out on it because it's just not going to be the same if it's it, if 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 it's Bob and a colander and a really powerful flashlight. <laughs> it's not 
It's not, <laughs> it's not going to produce, it's not going to produce a very satisfying nighttime sky of stars. Yeah. So, so you end up with then the need to have some funds to be able to operate that planetarium, uh, both in terms of its maintenance and in terms of the equipment that you'd have to buy. And so the will permitted us to charge a, a nominal amount to have people get in and see the show. Okay. Um, and, you know, over the years, tens of millions of people have done that. And that has helped us maintain the theater, the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, and buy the kind of equipment we need, sometimes with the help of friends of the observatory, to keep the planetarium on the cutting edge. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, I mean, that's just amazing that you guys have been able to to operate for free like that. But I mean, I guess you're you're required to. So even nobody can even bring it up in a meeting to start charging or anything like that. Um, I think that people... I. Uh, I wouldn't certainly imagine that over time people haven't thought about it um, because, you know, city budgets move with the economy. And when times are bad, um, people are looking around saying, where could we get a little bit more revenue? Um, Not to buy this or that, but to maintain the things that the city needs to maintain. And I think that's I think that's an important distinction. Um, that the public should recognize, that people should recognize that places exist and they continue to exist because they're maintained mm-hmm. and and that people maintain them and people who work cost money. Yep. And when cities pay for that maintenance, cities are spending tax money to make sure that facilities are maintained. And, you know, we're talking about the observatory, but you could be talking about a baseball field or a basketball court or uh, a rec center or or even a park. You have to maintain a park. You have to make sure all the sprinklers are always working. You have to, you know, maintenance is what keeps things from falling apart. And maintenance costs money and it takes time and it takes people. And so when cities you know, use tax dollars when they charge fees, when they are, as I said, looking around for revenue, they're looking around to make sure they can present to the public the face of the things that they love in the way that they love them and not take them offline because they can't be operated safely or they're broken or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I just think, I think that's a, a, an element of of public investment in infrastructure, and in our case, the observatory as infrastructure, and, and places that people go, public places, that they don't just exist in a bubble. And they're, you know, once you build them, they're there. Um, maintenance is the thing that always gets forgotten. Yeah. People are always very excited when they're building, and then they forget that places have to be operated. And like all things that are operated, The observatory has a whole variety of people, you know, because we have visitors observer building as instrument as our primary driving objective in terms of the way the place operates. But every one of those experiences is an experience that is um, modulated, moderated, assisted by people. So we have live show presentations. A live person runs the show. Um, a live person sells you a ticket. A live person takes your ticket from you. A live person is in each of the galleries as a museum guide to answer your questions about the exhibits or to tell you or give presentations about the Foucault pendulum or the Tesla coil um, or local noon every day when we do a ceremony about the sun passing across the local meridian or every one of every one of our telescopes has a telescope demonstrator because you can't just sit a telescope out on the lawn and say have at it you know look through mostly because that's not safe and also because it's not satisfying people have questions what is that i'm looking at why can i see it that way why does it look the way it does how far away is it what is it mm-hmm. um should i be afraid of it is it going to crash into us are there aliens coming from there to here uh, you know, any number of those kinds of experiences. We have people who help manage traffic. 
um, because we've oh, got a lot yeah. of traffic and we sure. got a lot of parking and you don't want to sit in a line if by some action by us, the line could move along just to make sure that people get where they need to go. We've got security officers who help protect the place. But the truth is, most of what they do is they help people when they fall down. And they almost always fall down, not inside the building, thankfully. I'm grateful for that and people's care and our own staff's care. Um, But they, you know, mostly they're helping people who've been injured on the trails that lead away from the building. Yeah. um, Because we're sort of a nexus for trailheads that then go other places. Or people show up wearing crazy shoes and then wanting to go hiking or it's a hundred and something degrees and oh. they have no water and they have no hat. So oddly they get heat frustration or heat exhaustion or something. Yeah. And so that's what our security, you know, our security. So it's all sorts of different kinds of people who work together. They're all city employees um, making a place like this function for people. And they're, some of them are present in front of you, you know, in, in terms of I'm hearing a show, I'm listening to a telescope demonstrator, I'm asking a question, I'm buying a ticket. And then some of them are behind the scenes, making sure that everything is working, or that all of those staff people are being paid or, you know, so it's a, there's a complexity to any place that you go, any public place that you go, that I think it's, it's not designed for you to think about it. It's yeah. just uh, when things don't go well, there are reasons why they don't go well. And when dollars are allocated and taxes are collected, I think people can have honest disagreements about what their tax dollars are spent for. But I hope that when they find that they have a wonderful experience at their local rec center or at their local skate park or their local Griffith Observatory, that they recognize that that's a public investment. Someone has decided, your representatives have decided that it is a public good to spend tax dollars to support that kind of an enterprise, and you enjoyed it. And so that was you. And so when we have programs, we often ask, you know, who here is president of the city of Los Angeles? Because we want to recognize those people that your tax dollars are the ones that are paying for this institution and this experience. Yeah. And, uh, and we encourage people to be, to join our support group because, you know, uh, when tax dollars aren't sufficient or when we need something that's really crazy or special or odd or hard to buy, um, it's good to have a friend. And so we have friends of the observatory, which is our nonprofit support group. Right. And they've, they've helped us since 1978 and they raise money, they have members. And so we're always encouraging people to become a member of Friends of the Observatory to help support the publicly funded experience at the observatory. Um, and over the years, Friends of the Observatory has done, you know, small things like helping us buy a historic book for our library to gigantic things like helping get the place renovated by raising tens of millions of dollars yeah. um, to, ha- to partner with the city to get the place restored. So they have been an indispensable partner to us. And I know people hear the term public-private partnership, and they wonder, what in the world does that mean? Mm-hmm. And I bet it doesn't work. And there are a lot of, there are some of them that don't work um, because public sector organizations are often very possessive of time and energy and money and, and control and cooperation. But uh, we in the Department of Recreation and Parks and Friends of the Observatory have found a way to work very, very, very closely together because we all have a similar vision about place. Good. And, you know, it, it is good because it's, if you don't have a shared vision, that's where things tend to go wrong. Yeah. is that people get ideas. Well, you know, I really think our fundraising should do this. And someone else says, no, I really think it should do that. And we've always had sort of a, a very, a very collaborative relationship with friends of the observatory um, about what it is that needed to be done. Um, and they most recently got a grant from the Amundsen Foundation to uh, improve the projection capability in the theater in 2015. 
Um, and that was a major effort to upgrade our projectors to uh, 8K resolution, which is you know sort of industry standard now in projection technology oh. and and that's not because it's you know there is no arms race here in terms of needing to have the best technology for the sake of having the best technology we have some old timey exhibits that are lovely and uh they involve very little technology at all because they don't need them and so all of our technology is to a purpose and in the case of the planet the Samuel Ocean Planetarium the purpose is effective storytelling. And the better projectors, they're brighter, they're richer in color, they're richer in detail and resolution. So when we tell stories, they're more resonant, they're more visually arresting and yeah. interesting. And so you, you are more than immersed into the environment of the story that we're trying to tell. Makes and sense. so that's so it, it's technology to a purpose, but no technology is costless. So when you do something like that, you you need that kind of help to invest in that kind of equipment um, that will serve people for you know years to come. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're sharing this stuff because it's something that, you know, like you said, when when somebody visits, you wouldn't even think about most of the time, you know, but it's I think it helps to have that perspective. So you, it helps to appreciate it and realize, you know, how special something like this is. I agree. And, and I think that, uh, you know, there is a perception of Los Angeles in particular as a city that has, uh, no past when in fact, of course it does. And we've talked about some of that past, you know, right here, but I think there, there is a perception that the city allowed a lot of its past to be unmade um, in the in the premise of making something new and shinier um, right. along the way, and you know there are probably our history is not as long as some of the places in the cities in the east, and like them, you know you don't always appreciate things that are historical in their own moment. Um, Thankfully, in the 80s and the 90s, there was a movement in Los Angeles, um, partly inspired by the L.A. Conservancy, by the destruction of some of the housing, the last great Victorian houses on Bunker Hill downtown for a big office complex. There was this sort of awakening that, OK, we're, we may be losing a little bit too much mm -hmm. and we might need to sort of step back. and. It was good that that happened when it did, because we were, you know, reaching our 50th birthday in 1985. And it was 1990 when Friends of the Observatory and the Observatory put together a plan for renovating and upgrading the observatory to take account of the fact that, you know, it was 55 years old and was going through a bit of a midlife crisis. <laughs> and the crisis was, as our architects later said, that the place was getting was being loved to death. Um, and by 1997, when we brought the architects on board, you know, they were really happy on one hand that the building itself was in such great shape that, right. you know, those those foot thick wall, those that they had built because of the earthquake, those were in fine shape. The finishes inside that, you know, Griffith's bequest was invested very conservatively so that during the depression, it was still there. Sure. And in the, you know, one of the things people forget about depressions, it, there isn't much good about depressions, but if you're trying to buy things in a depression, it is the time to buy things because right. prices are depressed because there's no demand. So the money that he had invested went farther than it probably otherwise would have if right. it had been normal times. So they were able to buy finishes that were, you know, bronze and travertine and marble and granite and, you know, those kinds of very, very fine finishes that make the place very spectacular. But architecturally, in addition to making it spectacular, they have another wonderful feature, which is 
those are all materials that are really, really durable. And so we had about 70 million people come through from 1935 to 2002 when we closed for the renovation. And the architects were delighted when they came on to find the physical infrastructure of the place was in really, really fantastic shape. That all those materials had done exactly what you'd hope they'd do, which is they'd borne up under the strain of 70 million visits. Mm -hmm. And the building had borne up under the strain of, you know, a a number of earthquakes since 1935. And that the physical infrastructure of the building was in great shape. So that's, you know, when the when the bones are secure, then the body is in a much better frame of mind. Mm -hmm. What wasn't in such good shape was air conditioning systems, such if the, you could even call what we had an air conditioning system, heating systems, piping, electrical conduit, any sense of connectivity inside mm-hmm. the building, all of those kinds of systems that make a modern building run, um, but were not in such good shape. Right. right. So the renovation could then focus on those kinds of systems and then on expanding the building. Yeah. Because, you know, when you open in 1935, Los Angeles is a certain size. And then now, you know, you remember when we talked earlier about the idea, of, well, when he gave the park, the very southern edge of the park, which is just south of where the observatory is, was two miles outside the city. Fast forward to 2002, and the observatory and the park are sitting pretty much dead center in the middle of an urban area of 10 million people. Mm-hmm. So there's no more outsideness. We are, we are, you know, everywhere in every direction, there's freeways running around and to and toward us. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people can come here and a lot of people were coming. And the old building was uh, wonderful, but not sufficient. And we didn't want to increase the size for the sake of increasing size, we wanted to give all of those people more room to spread out, have a good experience. Because if right. you're shoulder to shoulder with people, particularly nowadays, yeah. um, that's not so good. But even when there's not a coronavirus, it's not so good to be crowded when you want the room to have an in- enjoyable experience wherever it is you're going. And so we ended up... Um, building an addition underneath the front lawn. Because the other thing about preservation is you you can preserve a building, but you can change the way it looks, or you can change the way people look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that was interesting to us in looking at other institutions in the United States that had gone through renovation in New York, in Chicago, Denver, Oakland, each one of them had approached the physical form of their existing building in a different way. New York completely knocked down their old building. Chicago put a new ring around the back side of their building, a very different kind of structure than the old building that is very iconic, you know, very first planetarium in the United States. Um, Denver took an entirely different approach and sort of connected two older buildings with this gigantic new atrium. Um, sort of overhead. Uh, And so we were looking at that and trying to figure out, okay, so what are we really interested in here in Los Angeles? And the fact was on three sides of the observatory, there's a sloping hillside. So you can't really do anything with any of those three sides. So you're left with the front. Mm -hmm. And the front is a lawn, the astronomer's monument, and then the building. Right. And it's very it's iconic and to the to a significant extent looks exactly like it did in 1935 when when people sat on lawn chairs, you know, for the opening. And so the architects came up with the idea, well, OK, so you can't really do anything to any of the sides because you don't want to change any of the views. So we have to go underneath the front lawn. Yeah. And so we put the entire new exhibit gallery, including in addition to two exhibit galleries. Um, the cafe at the end of the universe, the stellar emporium bookstore and a new elevator and a new exit. And we put all of that under and some air handlers for that more modern air conditioning system that we would so happy to have. Yeah. Um, 
put all of that underground, then put the lawn back. And so as movie companies come to us, they're also glad because with the exception of the elevator popping out of the west side of the lawn, um, and it's sort of way over on the far west side. So as you approach the building, if you just sort of close your right eye a little bit, the building looks exactly as it would have if you'd walked up to it in 1935, which yeah, means so cool. that in the movies, we can play 1935, we can play 1950, we can play whatever year it is you want it to be, right. we can play it because... And if you came back, as one person did for the first time since visiting in 1935, Whoa. they came back after we reopened and said, well, I haven't been here since, <laughs> since 1935. Uh, well, a lot of it pretty much looks the same, doesn't it? Right. And I said, yes, I was very glad to see that. Um, and then you get inside and you realize, oh, you've more than doubled the amount of space. So people can, in fact, spread out. And one of the other things that we got was we got um, a presentation theater because the Samuel Ocean Planetarium has a very specific use and yep. we use it all day and we run shows all day and that's what it's designed to do. But that meant that we needed a place where we could do lectures and special presentations and our school program. And so downstairs in the new area underneath the lawn, we got the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon, which is a 200 seat presentation, you know, s sort of like a, a, a more severely raked movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do all sorts of programs. So we can do programming in two theaters at one time, plus the exhibits, plus public telescopes. So when we're, you know, doing something in full measure, we've got programming going on in every part of the building, which is great. It's what yeah. we always wanted. Doing lectures in the old planetarium was a nightmare, and, uh, and it just wasn't suited for it. The rooms mm -hmm. are designed for different purposes. And so, and obviously, it's named after Leonard Nimoy. Um, he and his wife w gave the first signature gift to the renovation activity. Um, oh. and, that, and we were delighted both for the gift, for the support that the Nimoy family gave us, not just in terms in terms of the money, but in terms of, you know, helping to recruit other people to give yeah. and the note and the notoriety of that gift in the media actually drew in another person who became a major donor because they'd read about Leonard Nimoy giving to this project that they knew nothing about and wanted to know more and then ultimately became a donor and the main new exhibit hall underneath the lawn is named the Richard and Lois Gunther Depths of Space because the Gunthers came to us and and wanted to wanted to know more about this this project at a place that they love. Very and cool. yeah, it was. It's a and and the Nimoy's were, you know, who wouldn't want who wouldn't want their theater to be named after Leonard Nimoy? Yeah, that's so, awesome. I mean, honestly. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it is awesome. And, and it is part of what makes the place uh, such a great, you know, there's little stories like that, or in that case, a big story, you know, everywhere that you turn, uh, which I think is, you know, it was our 85th birthday this year. Uh, we couldn't celebrate the way we wanted to with people. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it doesn't change the fact that We've been doing what we've been doing for 85 years and serving the people of Los Angeles and the world and and doing it, you know, in a way that is part of the community where, yeah. you know, the observatory is situated above a neighborhood. The Greek theater is situated above a neighborhood. And we are part of we're part of Los Angeles. We're part of the world, but we're also part of uh, the Los Feliz neighborhood. and you know, you want to be a good neighbor and, uh, you're 85. So, you know, you, you can, you can share perspective with people. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that, I guess that's, that's what 85 year old people do. They, right. they share perspective about what have they learned during the course of their life. And we've seen a lot of things, but, uh, we're grateful. I'm grateful personally to work in a place like this because I, I like doing something that has that kind of meaning. Mm -hmm. And that kind of purpose to it. I've always tried to work at places where I could feel like that was 
some that that I was doing something that uh, that made a difference for people. And yeah. the observatory is a place that just does. Whether people like the science, or they like the architecture, they like the inspiration, they like just physically being here, they like the view. It doesn't much matter why they like it. They just do. And it, it's one of those, because we're free and because our audience looks like Los Angeles, you have the situation that's nice that in every community, there need to be some civic gathering places, particularly these days, where if we could gather, we could all gather and everyone could be present and you know, from every part of the city, from every part of the world, and they could be present and they could be present together happily Mm -hmm. and without, without anxiety, without stress, without question, you know, this is a place where everybody is welcome and, and people approach it that way. And we're fortunate in that regard because certainly people from this area take significant ownership in the place. And we, given our visitorship, we should have more graffiti and, uh, and damage, sure. uh, but we, but we don't, Yeah. but we don't. And, and I think a big part of that is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a credit to our security. It's a credit to our staff and their watchfulness and their care, um, because we have a fabulous staff, uh, and they are our face to the public. Uh, but I think it also is partly a responsibility of the public, and it's one that they've taken. And so people are watchful because they care about the place. And we get inquiries, why is this and why is that? And you should be sure you do this and you should be sure you do that. And they're right and good for them. Good for them for caring enough yeah. to write and say, you know, uh, don't forget to take care of that. Don't forget about that. Make sure that's safe. And we're grateful for that because that means people care. And if you can get people these days to care about something, that's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. So totally, man. Well, Mark, this is awesome. Like I totally want to visit and uh, I'm sure people listening, hopefully we inspired some people to come check it out for sure. Um, Yeah. I, I, I don't know how you could not want to come visit after this. (laughs) That's my, you know, I started as a volunteer for Friends of the Observatory, and uh, then was lucky enough to work for them uh, on the renovation, and then was lucky enough to get the job that I have now with the city. And so I've been associated with the place for 23 years. And every night when I leave, I remember why I like coming here so much. And a lot of it is about the place and what it does and so on and so forth. But like a lot of people, my first experience here was just I didn't really come to see the building. I came to see the view. Mm -hmm. I came because I was told this is not Ohio. You need to go to the observatory and look out over Los Angeles and appreciate how this is not Ohio. Right. And uh, I didn't even come inside, which I'm now very embarrassed to admit. Uh, But in the time that I've been associated with the place, the nicest thing has always been when you leave in the evening and there's people just enjoying themselves on the lawn or enjoying themselves inside the galleries. Um, they're, they're happy to be here. They're looking out over the city uh, and it, it's a, it's a place where people come and maybe for a brief moment, they're transported from their daily lives and they get to consider some of the bigger questions that life can pose the night sky often draws out those kinds of questions, but also just relief from the congestion and the hustle and the bustle of the of the city below. Yep. And just a moment of contemplation or fun or whatever it is that they that they want to do. Um, the place is there and it's there for them. And one of the reasons why we did the renovation was to make sure that you know, 85 years from now, it'll be there again for them or for whoever is coming to visit then. So it's, it's a, it's important to have places like that. It's important for people to go to places like that. And it's really great to work at a place like that. So 
I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to listen to my tales of Griffith Observatory because it's a it is an icon of, of Los Angeles and I think deserving of that designation and of the people's affection for it because certainly the people who work here have that kind of affection so yeah thank you for uh, for listening and to your listeners for and uh, and we do as you said look forward to a time and it will come. Um, when we can welcome people back. Our grounds are open. Our parking lot is open. The trails are open. Oh, okay. So That's you good. can you can hike around. And, uh, and I will say to those people, I'm probably going to ruin it for everyone, um, the trails are not filled with people. Um, and our lawn is not filled with people. So it's actually a very nice place to be okay. right now. Um, so I, I encourage people to do that. And then when the building can finally reopen safely, uh, you will get to visit, other people will get to visit, and we will be glad again to have people back visiting. Yes, heck yeah. And then so should we send people to the to your website? Is that the place best place? Sure. For them? They, they can do that. Uh, if they Google Griffith Observatory, we come up first. Uh, we're griffithobservatory.org. Um, you can find us on all of the travel sites. You can find us on, you know, uh, we, we, it is important too, uh, that since we're closed that, uh, you can find us at our website, but you can also find us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. And we do virtual programming, um, all space considered, which is our monthly astronomy and space uh, update. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. It has, uh, such a great heart to it. Um, it, it feeds the head, but the thing that makes it special is that it's not a lecture. It's a, it's a presentation by a whole variety of different kinds of people. And there's a lot of heart in it. And that's what I love so much about it. It's what makes it different from a lot of other things. Um, there's sky finding charts on our website, in our sky report. Um, and we also have been posting them online. And so I, I encourage people to look at those things because they give you the opportunity, you know, you can come to the observatory and you can look through our telescope, but you can also walk outside and, and if you can get up a little high, you can look up at the sky. And if you know what you're looking for, there's things there. Right now, there are, I think, four planets up, two in the morning and two at night. Oh. And you can see them and they're bright and you're going to and you are seeing them. You just don't know what they are. Right. But we have sky charts that are very simple to use. They don't have every single detail of every single thing. They just show you the big things and they show you roughly where they were. There was just a comet, you know, that for once wasn't disappointing. It was actually something you could see with your naked eye. Um, I saw it and I'm usually the last person to see things. So it was very gratifying. There was a meteor shower a couple days ago in Los Angeles, is not the greatest place to watch a meteor shower, uh, sure. Joshua tree, much better, much yeah. better. Um, but people can make observations and, and they can look up at the night sky and they can understand it at some level. And the resources that our programming team has put on our website will help them do that. And then the final thing that I will say is uh, there's a mission from NASA that's at Jupiter right now. It's called the Juno mission, and it takes pictures of Juno. And what has been developed is software that allows you to uh, make your own version of those images to enhance some things, to to change the way the colorization works. And there is uh, right now on our website, a a tutorial on how to do that, how to download it, how to use it, and then a step-by-step instruction, how you can create your own images of Jupiter. Wow. Um, And and that's the idea of that kind of data, is that it's supposed to be shared with people, and then they can do something with it. And people who are sophisticated with computers have always been able to do that. But what this is, is this is for people like me, who are not astronomers, but who love the idea of being a, who love the idea of space and astronomy and have limited computer skills. Um, 
but could probably get through this based on this tutorial that's given by our program supervisor. So it's a, I commend that and all of those resources to people to follow while we're closed and uh, to stay in touch with the sky and stay in touch with us. Yeah, totally. Man, well, that's great. That's so good to hear you guys have all that. I'll have a link for people listening. I'll have a link to your website and your social media and all that kind of stuff. So they can check that out easy. Yeah. Man, thanks so much, Mark. This was awesome. Super. I love learning about all the backstory of this. I I really think it's important. It, It helps to kind of appreciate these things better when you come and visit. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and that your viewers return to the observatory sometime soon yes it'll happen for all of us so take care and uh we will talk again later all right have a good one thanks again mark all righty bye-bye